having the opportunity to share some of the work uh, that we are doing together these years. Um, we, Bill and I have been working together for over 20 years now since he was uh, the moderator in the late 90s and I was at the university at the time and uh, we have collaborated together through Faith in the Common Good and uh, worked on a variety of different projects over the years and uh, we'll maybe touch on that but both of us are kind of long in the tooth on the social justice <laughs> side of uh, United Church Ministry and um, this is uh, an evolution of our thinking and uh, hopefully a fresh response that both grows out of our experience and um, uh, represents a way of looking forward. So we're talking about uh, eco-commoning, a down-to-earth way of life, a new way of uh, bringing us back to earth, a new way of grounding us uh, in that connection and a way of life being our ethic, how we live out our interconnection with each other. So, uh, Bill, do you want to set us up in terms of why it's important to talk about all this stuff? Yes, uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm situated in, in Calgary, Alberta, in case uh, you needed to know where we're, where we're from. Um, poet Mary Oliver, uh, she's actually a wonderful poet who died over a year ago. She once said, the only question is how to love this world. And uh, Scott Momande, a, a, a Cherokee person, says this, we humans must come again to a moral comprehension of the earth and air. We must live according to the principles of a land ethic. The alternative is that we shall not live at all. And for me, those two, those two quotes uh, set us up for sort of some of the grounding of eco commoning now, COVID-19 has brought a colossal pause in human activity in Mother Earth. And naturally, it has focused, has forced us to focus on only it just about and leave everything else at least in the margins. So whatever Ted and I say uh, today and what, whatever we are engaged with today, uh, this reality is in front of us, obviously. In, in addition to COVID-19, we're, we're being confronted once again with systemic racism in our societies. Uh, so these two realities have come charging into our common life these days, and uh, we need them in the backs of our minds. But we must never forget, in my view, uh, some other realities that are part of our common life, that embrace us. Things like uh, the climate crisis, the, the huge gap between the very wealthy and extreme poverty. And for us, underlying it all is the fact that uh, Mother Earth can no longer sustain our hyper-consumption. There are limits to human activity. Mother Earth is wounded and brokenhearted. Uh, and a, no, a lot of us are realizing that we cannot go back, that this pause has opened some doors and we can't go backwards. So this, for me, all of these things mean it's a wonderful time to be alive. And it's a wonderful time to be the church because everywhere I go in, in my community anyway, people are looking for direction. And they're looking for a moral and ethical and a spiritual foundation for that direction. And we are people of vision. And the issues that we face as we confront and try to articulate a vision are ethical, moral, and, and spiritual. So this is our moment, a very special moment in the human journey. We cannot go back to what we thought was normal. So therefore, what is the way forward? Well, we believe that eco-commoning reflects a worldview that honors Mother Earth and respects human dignity, where cooperation contrasts with 
domination, where community well-being contrasts with extreme individualism, where equity contrasts with disparity, and where respect for Mother Earth contrasts with plundering Mother Earth. So for me, these are extremely exciting times to be alive and to be the church, exciting times for a new vision and new opportunities. Uh, Rabbi Abraham Heschel uh, said this, in, the, in any age, but I think particularly in this one, we must live, or we are called to live really, in radical amazement for the possibilities that lie before us. So how do we reframe our conversations and our visions? And basically what we are about is reframing. So I take it over to Ted. Thank you, Bill. So when we are talking about eco-commoning, we're uh, using language that uh, we hope helps to formulate a, a vision of how we want to live into the future. And it has some of these core values uh, behind the whole concept of the commons and eco, eco being uh, economic, uh, ecological, ecumenical, uh, the coming together, managing the household. So a commons is local, it's cooperative, it's sustainable, uh, it's under a relational rather than an individualistic uh, mind frame. So what we want to do in these three sessions is talk first about the importance of language and metaphor and what Bill was just saying about reframing the conversation. Secondly, we want to delve into some of the new science and understanding of our deep history and how we as a species have come to where we are now and learn from our past, um, both good and bad, and how that carries us forward. And then in the third session, uh, be more specific about eco comedy examples that are already happening in the world and how we as the church uh, can respond and um, find new ways forward. So Bill highlighted uh, some of these challenges that we face and uh, also that we live in uh, interesting times that uh, there's challenges, but there's also opportunities that this is a, a liminal time, an, an in-between time. And uh, so how do we grasp and uh, how do we move into this change time? So uh, I think some of the things that uh, we've struggled with over the years is what's the right language? How do we um, find new ways of expressing uh, the, the future that we want? That language is absolutely core uh, to uh, building this different model. It, it emerged uh, or highlighted for me uh, when Bill and I, back in the early 2000s, began to collaborate with David Suzuki on uh, the nature challenge and we developed uh, greening sacred spaces as a response and that's the me the goofy looking guy that promised David that uh, we would go out and uh, get all kinds of church people to sign up for the nature challenge to do a few simple things to respond to the climate crisis as it uh, was emerging and so I went off to speak to congregations, you know, there'd be a couple hundred people and I'd pass out these uh, brochures with the 10 nature challenge and ask people to commit uh, to two or three of these challenges and uh, so that we could hand them back into the Suzuki Foundation and we'd work together on it. So out of 200 people, I'd maybe get back two or three of these uh, responses and uh, kind of blew me away, you know, what's going on? Why? Uh, do people have such a hard time committing to such simple things? And so it pushed us uh, to think more deeply about how change happens and how, um, you know, how embedded language is and the metaphors and the frame uh, that uh, lives in our head and that it isn't an easy process. You know, me babbling at you folks uh, isn't going to change things in a, uh, a short-term kind of way. So um, uh, what was helpful to me was uh, discovering the work by George Lakoff. 
And um, uh, are you guys seeing, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're seeing the, the quote better. Um, liberals have no idea that language is not neutral, it's framed. They have the idea that facts will set you free. They won't. The facts unframed won't set you free. People won't reach the appropriate conclusions. So, you know, good liberals, uh, radicals, socialists, or however we describe ourselves, uh, you know, we've been under the impression that if we preach a powerful sermon or convince people, uh, they will uh, change their perspective. Well, uh, it's, it's a much <laughs> bigger picture than, than that. Um, so, let's see, how do I get myself to move? Okay, so what's a frame? Frame is a mental structure that allows human beings to understand reality. So our frames are unconscious and automatic. So uh, in Lakoff's uh, book, that I'll come to in a minute, uh, he, he describes uh, this whole framing process and that the reality is 98% of how we hear each other runs through this frame, a uh, subconscious level. And so very little uh, what we take in isn't just being filtered uh, through the frames. Uh, it's illumined in this uh, book, uh, uh, don't, think, don't Think of an Elephant. This is what he uses in his graduate course. He says to the students, you know, don't think of an elephant. And, and of course, everybody does, right? And that's, they learned that, uh, particularly in the US, the conservatives, conservative politics have uh, paid, uh, understood that if you just put it out there, I mean, you just listen to Donald Trump and you put out an image of, you know, crooked Hillary or lock her up or whatever, but uh, it, it, you put it out there and it goes into people's heads. So unless you frame yourself, uh, other people uh, will frame you, the media, your enemies, competition, even your well-meeting friends. So uh, for Lakoff, uh, he, in, in the book, he describes that there are two uh, kind of competing frames that stand out, um, particularly when he's thinking in American politics. There's a progressive frame, a conservative frame, and then there's about a third uh, of, of a mixed frame. So, and when you think about politics, it's all about trying to convince the, the middle group uh, to lean one way or another. Uh, the middle group has some of, of both leanings. And so, you know, we see that in Canadian politics that 30%, 40% uh, makes a huge difference in which way things swing. Um, so in defining it, he uh, says that family groupings are a, a good way to understand it. And so the strict father uh, represents the conservative frame, that the world is a scary place, that uh, we need to rule by moral authority, it's hierarchical, the whole 50s father knows best notion and uh, need to be responsible for uh, discipline. So that frames one side of how people look at the world. Uh, when I was uh, choosing or trying to find a, a strict father image, uh, guess who came up <laughs> in terms of, of representing that kind of perspective? On a progressive or liberal perspective, uh, he describes the nurturant parent as the, another perspective, um, that the world is essentially a good place, that children are essentially good and need to be encouraged, and empathy and responsibility are the drivers uh, in this. So depending, uh, you know, and there's good and bad in both within the conservative and progressive, um, you know, the conservative has good structure and uh, uh, discipline and those kind of values. Uh, the nurturant side is more empathetic, but as, as we saw earlier, you know, can be too loosey goosey, can you know, be too um, all over the place. And so both have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Lakoff saw Elizabeth Warren as representing uh, that kind of perspective in the world. So even pushing further back into understanding how language is so important, um, cognitive science has recognized that 
babies learn native languages in the first six months and it begins to shape neural pathways where uh, as homo sapiens, uh, you know, we are kind of this empty um, vessel that needs to be formed. And so, you know, early childhood development stuff, we see those developments. And you see in these brain scans that it takes up until age 24 until uh, our, our neural pathways are more or less formed. And so once you've got that forming, uh, then your, you know, your world is framed through the strict father or the nurturant parent uh, approach to things. And you then filter um, everything that's said to you through those windows. Uh, so in, in differentiating these kinds of worldviews, the uh, free market or neoliberal capitalism, emphasis on the conservative side where less government and free trade, uh, socially conservative uh, versus the progressive uh, liberal social democratic capitalism, managed markets, government has a role, socially liberal. So uh, that's, uh, we, we see this highlighted over and over again, particularly in American politics, but certainly in our own um, uh, the differing political perspectives. And it's hard for us to, when they talk about Trump's base, uh, your filtering, the frame is uh, straight through on that kind of conservative um, perspective. So is it possible to reframe uh, the conversation? Uh, we live within this, the dominant frame that uh, humans are essentially um, self-serving, the whole survival of the fittest, shop to a drop, doggy dog kind of world, free market capitalism is a, a dominant world, you know, and I certainly, that's part of my whole upbringing and who I am as well. But what we're trying to understand is there's a whole history and perspective that's different and that this tradition can also be lifted up, that we're primarily relational creatures, that uh, happiness is about generosity and uh, lovemaking. Everything is interrelated, the web of life, um, our posters, the golden rule and the green rule, empathize that humans essentially have this caring, empathetic relationship with the world and uh, with each other. So uh, in thinking or wanting you to, to talk about it, um, can you see the importance of this framing uh, as shaping the conversations that are around you? Uh, and can you begin to imagine that uh, by reframing things, by working on this in the, in the long term, you can see uh, different ways that we can move forward with our language so that it's helpful in uh, pushing us to a different place. Um, so, the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to get you folks so that you're not in front of my screen there. Anyway, so, what we're trying to do in this section is there's been some great books by Harari and um, Jeremy Lent and so on that looks uh, at our deep history. And what's exciting to me in this era is, you know, most of us, uh, when I learned history, it was kind of this lineal progression and that we were the latest, greatest of this evolutionary chain and we're at the top of the uh, this cognitive development and so on. So what this deep history is telling us is that our brains and our abilities have more or less been the same for the last 30 to 70,000 years. And so that we can look at our human experience as uh, representing different approaches uh, to life uh, as homo sapiens and that this can inspire us so we can learn from both the strengths and weaknesses, and it's not this lineal, linear uh, track coming forward. So I want to quickly uh, jump you through about 100,000 years of history here, if I can, in a very quick amount of time. So uh, Homo sapiens, that's the red. Uh, there was um, Homo erectus and Neanderthals uh, back in the day. Uh, and so somehow there's you know whole theories and understanding of how uh, Homo sapiens how we uh, managed to survive amongst the the, the others uh, that 
uh, both inhabited our, our place. And you can see the migration patterns of the, the red lines, how uh, Homo sapiens came to uh, dominate in the, as our species. So uh, it's within, and, and so people like Harari and uh, Sapiens and his other books uh, break it into four uh, different sections, the hunter-gatherer, the agricultural development, scientific revolution of the last 400 years, and then the, the current period that we're in. And uh, so we're asking whether we can look forward. Um, the interesting thing is somehow between 70 and 30,000 years ago, we had this leap forward in our cognitive development that uh, enabled us to use language uh, in this, the way that we've uh, begun to, to do it. Um, this cognitive re revolution happened, uh, they speculate that it was uh, sharing information. Somehow we became better at um, conveying information. All animals can communicate in some form or another, but we managed to uh, evolve to use language in a more detailed way to describe that the lion is down by the river and we need to look out and uh, what are we going to do in response. The other uh, theory is that gossip uh, was the means of uh, communication. We needed to know about each other in our little groupings and uh, we need to know that uh, uh, this woman over here was good at um, berry picking and this guy over here uh, was empathetic and this other guy was a hunter and so on, right? So gossiped about each other and that was a theory for uh, this cognitive leap. Uh, the whole understanding of wonderment, looking up into the sky and finding language for it, uh, finding descriptions uh, to describe this wonderment. Uh, we live in this incredible spiritual world and uh, you can see the figures in the sky. So language uh, came to represent uh, this more symbolic level uh, beyond the literal. So uh, for these early folks, nature was a loving parent, uh, part of the family, that everything was interconnected. There wasn't really a religious uh, understanding because you lived within the spirit world. Everything was interconnected and you lived in that reality. About uh, 30,000, 30, 40,000 years ago, uh, symbolic language, this zoomorphic sculpture, the Pujo, uh, represented this leap in our abstract thinking of using a symbol to describe um, this connection between kind of a spiritual world and the human world. And it was a, a huge leap forward. Uh, cave art, uh, and uh, on the CBC a week or so ago, there was this thing around uh, how they used ostrich eggs uh, as means of communication and travel um, so that the, these ostrich eggs represented kind of a token that gave you access and if you needed to travel into other people's territories. So all these represent the beginnings of our uh, coming together and working together. And these, and w one of the, the cool things I think is recognizing that we, we primarily functioned in groups of 50 to 100 people and that each of these uh, groupings had different values. Some were more family-centric, uh, some had open relationships, some were um, more inclusive, some were more homophobic, so on and so on, right? And then each of these groupings had its own kind of contextual values. And that uh, these folks were highly intelligent about their bioregion. Their, their brains were as large or bigger than ours and uh, had a huge amount of knowledge because your whole survival uh, depended on it. So uh, we, we look at these characteristics and begin to see some things that we can carry forward. Uh, when I googled equality, uh, the Flintstones came up <laughs> as representing uh, equality. I, I don't know about that, but um, there was there's this whole theory around alpha males being contained by these groups of 50 to 100 people because the group was small enough and 
um, no one wanted uh, the alpha males to be in charge. And so there was boundaried um, relationships. So then you move into the agricultural sector. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we, we know all about this. Uh, cultivating grains uh, began to permanent settlements. Um, uh, but interestingly, the, uh, uh, even though um, there was uh, these settlements, it meant that the, um, there was increased mortality because they were eating less diverse uh, foods. Um, they weren't as healthy as the hunter-gatherers. And so uh, agriculture brought some civilizing factors, but in terms of human well-being, um, the monotony and the organizing uh, didn't necessarily uh, work out well for everybody in that context. Um, so uh, theorizing about alpha males as you got beyond the groups of 100 people, uh, the alpha males were able to dominate, um, uh, use debt, so acquiring land became more aggressive. And so we have the whole hierarchy of organization that we've seen um, down through the, the centuries. So on the one hand, we hear it presented as this wonderful civilizing thing. On the other hand, uh, do we really appreciate patriarchy and authoritarian structures and so on? Like, is that really the method we want? Uh, the axial age, uh, there's this great leap forward in terms of religious development around 800 BC and uh, where Judaism and Taoism and so on in, in the East. Um, this shift in our, uh, from uh, that earlier spirit world uh, into uh, notions of polytheism uh, and then into monotheism. And, uh, you know, so we see that in the Old Testament in that evolution, you know, early days of the Hebrews, they were polytheistic and, and there's all of the push towards a, a one God. And that sort of is parallel with hierarchies in terms of civilizations as well. All of a sudden, God represents a patriarchal God, a patriarchal um, uh, authority structure. So there's all these parallels that we're pulling apart. Uh, it's really important for us in the West to appreciate the dualistic thinking of Socrates and Plato and how that has shaped our binary look of the world of humans and mind body and so in this whole notion of transcendent uh, god versus material world is that really the way we want to understand it the chinese and taoism and confucianism uh, saw the world more in a, a harmonious understanding the yin yang and so as we are a global community which religious systems uh, do we want to pick up on so we move into the uh, leap forward into the last 400 years in the scientific evolution and uh, how that disrupted our religious thinking in in many ways right it was a push back uh, no longer god up above the clouds uh, dictating things uh, uh, we began to see a cosmos in a whole different way with galileo and Newton um, uh, used math and uh, a different understanding, a mechanistic understanding. So then the world begins to be framed in these mechanistic ways. We get deism, uh, God is a giant clockmaker in the sky. And that has dominated Newtonian physics down to the 20th century. Um, Bacon, uh, the power of domination that humans are above the others and that are masters and possessors of nature, uh, beginning of the whole kind of colonial thinking. Uh, printing press, uh, Reformation, uh, Descartes, I think therefore I am, this whole understanding of mind, body, and that kind of dualism that we've inherited. Uh, the great, some of the great thinkers, uh, Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, um, we should put in Darwin, um, and uh, all kinds of uh, credible things that happened in the 19th century. Uh, three kinds of humanist religions. Um, this is Harari breaks it out as liberal humanism, the emphasis on individuals, socialist emphasis on the collective, 
evolutionary humanism. Uh, this led to kind of the Aryan understanding. The Nazis pick up on this, that uh, the Aryans are better uh, species than others, and therefore you can eliminate other species. So we, we still live within very much this humanist framework. Uh, the industrial revolutions that have happened, um, the reality of our population growth in the 20th century. Um, uh, on a positive side, the whole notion that uh, governments and democratic governments can respond and created the welfare states, all the experiments in the 20th century between the Nordic and European and the Anglo approaches to uh, the response. All leading to the wonderful post-war suburban uh, dream. Uh, for many of us, we grew up uh, with this, and the suburbs and the station wagon and the boat and um, you know, this was in many ways seen as kind of the epitome of everything coming together. Uh, but it's uh, led since the mid part of the 20th century into questions of, is this really the way we want to uh, live our lives? Does the free market, the neoliberal um, way of deregulation, we've seen where that led in terms of 2008 and uh, kind of the consumerist perspective. There's women looking, uh, representing the shopping in a, a religious kind of perspective. Uh, we've seen the manipulation, people like Exxon um, recognize the impacts of climate change and yet actively uh, tried to deny it, as well as big plastic. Uh, these six men represent uh, half the world's wealth. Six men, uh, kind of incredible inequality. And this picture is even uh, out of date. Uh, Bezo, uh, there's, it's down to about three or four. Uh, representing half the words wealth. So 2008, and here we are. Like, um, this is uh, kind of an interesting take, you know, the CNN world that is so much before us. Is this really what she's saying in terms of the values? Uh, we are all separate from each other. Nature is a machine. We're all selfish. Technology is the solution. Everything is meaningless. Fill it with consumerism. Is that not the dominant worldview that we see around us and that uh, we're considering? So uh, the challenge that we're in, is this the end of the capitalist era? Is there an eco commoning uh, development that can learn from the others, this liminal time? So looking back over this history, can we see it, uh, what can we learn from our hunter-gatherers? The importance of small groupings, men and women cooperating, um, each group, uh, each commons having its own values, uh, being highly intelligent about bioregion. You know, in many ways we want to carry forward those hunter values. Um, this idea of nature as a parent and uh, us living in these kind of family relationships. Um, uh, practices from organic era, uh, you know, what have we learned in the 10,000 years? Can we carry those values forward? Uh, the scientific era, uh, there's the challenges, but, you know, we've advanced tremendously because of the scientific era. So uh, can we bring this together in a different vision of an eco-commons and uh, represent it in how we carry forward. Our history has all of these elements in it for both good and bad and uh, I think there's an opportunity to reframe things so that we begin to live in a different way. So there's a hundred thousand years represented in uh, 10 or 15 minutes and um, what do you think about that? What, was there that? Um, what would you leave behind? What would you carry forward? Connected from a authoritarian to a pure governance. Uh, we see uh, in this era, right, the governments that are working are not these guys in the boots. Uh, it's governments led by women who have a different approach uh, to governance and truth telling and so on. There's a whole uh, challenge to the authoritarian structures. And 
from mechanistic to complex reciprocal causality. The little bird uh, is getting some food and the crocodile is getting its teeth uh, picked. And uh, this is how nature works and interacts. Um, reframing our faith uh, our perspectives um, from a Christian perspective, from the guy in the sky to energetic presence. I, I rarely use theistic language anymore. I uh, speak in energetic uh, complexity language in terms of how I organize my worship services. So can we uh, look at our deep history, uh, hear the traditional stories and understanding the framing, uh, how the stories convey meaning, uh, but do it not at the exclusion of science, but how does science help us with this storytelling? Uh, one great example uh, is out on Gabriola Island, the commons out there, and how these folks uh, have worked together over the last uh, close to 10 years now in creating this commons and doing food and a uh, whole variety of uh, commoning activities and sharing the land. They developed a transportation service there called Gertie, and uh, people transporting around the island. Uh, they, they were able to get some grants and got some buses and some people to volunteer, and so it created a, you know, a commons uh, transportation system to enable the islanders to get around. Um, this is uh, colleagues of Joshua's at, uh, and, and uh, Carla's um, people living together in downtown Toronto, St. Clarence Commons, they call it. Uh, young people uh, intentionally choosing to buy a property together and organize it in a commons kind of way. Uh, here's some of the things in the Aurelia community where I'm working our sharing garden, the farmer's market, uh, community shared agriculture, uh, the refillery district, a different way of retailing without packaging. So uh, lots of food commons initiatives. Uh, all the digital world, uh, open source, um, the way information is connected around the world. Uh, there's literally hundreds of millions of creative commons licenses now uh, that are open source to everybody. Uh, so whole different way of understanding how to organize that business. Um, this is a, an internet um, cooperative or commons and how, how they organize uh, that service. This uh, Brutzog, I'm saying it right, uh, 10,000 uh, healthcare workers, a different way of organizing healthcare so that it's local and sensitive to the needs of people rather than just the delivery of rote kind of health care, the kinds of things that have gotten us in trouble by uh, low paid workers having to do a bunch of uh, mechanistic jobs. This is a whole uh, commons approach to doing health care out of the Netherlands. Um, Eco commons, this is the language I'm working with at uh, St. Paul's um, in the in working with indigenous community, uh, local community kitchens, and so on. So uh, beginning to experiment and using regularly my language with people, uh, instead of calling it worship, it's times of celebration and ceremonies, um, pastoral care, how do we care for each other and the planet? Um, how do we learn together rather than this kind of example of me speaking at you? How do, how do we do that in a more uh, cooperative uh, commons way? Um, how do we, instead of outreach us to them, those poor people, uh, how do we do community engagement so that all of us are benefiting uh, from a different economic approach? Um, different ways of looking at hospitality. How do we share our resources uh, more effectively? Um, so it's, it's back, it's uh, generational, it's ways of lifting up and thinking about commons in a whole different way. So uh, I've thrown at you a bunch of examples. Bill, um, you want to add into this conversation? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> just, just a few comments. Uh, and then uh, I guess for me, what the, uh, what the challenge is. Um, can people hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, all right. 
uh, all my ministry, and that, that means uh, three congregations, two in Toronto and one in Calgary, plus being executive secretary of Alberta Northwest Conference, and then as moderator, uh, all of my ministry has been rooted in the idea that the church is called to turn inside out for the sake of the world. So our job is to uh, care for uh, the world, not only in our own neighborhood, but beyond. We, that's why we're here. We exist for the well-being of the world, including Mother Earth. Um, and so all my ministry has been helping to develop cooperation with a community. So the, the congregations I was in, we were able to get all kinds of community groups to come into those buildings, share office space, share um, the building in some very profound ways, and literally have thousands of people uh, be part of that community through a whole range of community groups using the building. And, um, and, and that's, that was great. And uh, there's some very interesting examples of that. Uh, the problem for me, as we're trying to move into how to address the, our current situation, is that most of what we did and what many congregations are doing around the country are still within the dominant culture, the dominant political and economic system. Most of those examples do not challenge the, uh, the market capitalist system at all. They just assume it. And, and so for me, eco-commoning provides the next iteration of how we live together politically and economically. And as we tried to explain, it offers a different lens through which we see um, the world. And that means a different lens for systems of ownership, governance, and those kinds of things, all embedded in the uh, real needs and the nurture of Mother Earth. That is the bioregion in which uh, our uh, ministries are located. And, and so what we're, what we're challenged with, for me, in, in really creating an eco-commoning way of life and organization, is it goes beyond mere cooperation. It goes beyond just renting space in our buildings. It creates, as I said, a new, new forms of governance, of actually ownership of that facility and how we organize it, how we govern it, and, and so on. Uh, so I think the exciting thing is about this whole enterprise is how we move beyond what some of us are already doing in terms of a cooperative action uh, for the common good and can we find new ways of actually sharing the ownership and governance of how we live uh, in an eco-commoning way in our local communities and I like some of the examples you've given Ted those are uh, those are terrific and the challenge for us I think is can we do similar kinds of things uh, in our communities of faith, located in our local uh, communities. Um, because what we're talking about is implementing a new worldview. And as I said at the beginning of my comments, uh, people are kind of hungry for something different. They know we need something different. And I think we can help with that. But it involves a different way, even from what we're doing now. 